This story begins, as many others do, by happenstance. For health reasons, I walk a lot. I'm getting up in years, and cardio is indeed my friend. Luckily, where I live, there are numerous trails and parks to get exercise. It's ideal when you want to have scenery and a view, instead of a boring old treadmill. A few years ago, I bought one of those telescopical climbing poles from a well-known outdoors outfitter for the more treacherous areas that I walk, but I also carry it for practical reasons. I mean, in the wild, you encounter wildlife a lot. Even in my rural neighborhood, some of the neighbor's dogs roam free. Most couldn't care less about me walking by, but when I walk my dog, that's a totally different matter. Seeing a large wolf-like husky triggers some primal territorial instinct in them to attack the both of us. They charge at her like she's the canine antichrist for God's sakes, and I'm caught directly in the middle of their turf war. It doesn't matter that we're on public property and my dog doesn't care less about what's theirs. They're too triggered to be controlled and their irresponsible owners don't care about the mandatory leash and fence laws. I carry the metal pole to defend us when the need arises. On one of my hiking excursions, I stepped off the trailhead until I was far enough out of sight so I could answer the call of nature. Between two huge pine trees, I spotted an oddly shaped stick with a glaring ray of sunshine focused right in the middle of it. Well, it hadn't been manipulated by human hands, it was highly unusual looking. And to be quite honest, I was smitten by it. It was the Excalibur of random sticks in the forest. Vines had once wrapped around it, which served to deform the palm-sized trunk. It caused a spiral serpentine pattern running the full length of it, with bulged edges in the spaces where normal growth hadn't been restricted. It was about five feet long and just about the right size to serve as a walking stick for me. Gandalf himself would have chosen it as his staff. The remnants of the root ball at the end were perfectly shaped to grip my fist. It fit like a glove in my hand. I carried the amazing discovery back home to use it the next time I walked. My fancy store-bought hiking pole went into the closet. That night, I actually dreamt about the curious woodland find. How boring are my conscious thoughts that I dream of gnarled sticks. In all fairness though, this was no ordinary peach of birch that I just happened to walk upon. The ray of light was perfectly affixed on it. I knew in my heart I was meant to discover it, even if the actual reasons for the kismet was not yet evident. As the weekdays passed, my fixation on the bewitched staff dissipated only slightly. When the weekend arrived, so did the desire to put it to good use. Now, my dogs need regular walking, so I try to encourage exercise for the both of us. Anyone with a husky knows that they are anxious and raring to go the minute you grab your walking gear. They live for those little pleasures. So, the second I gathered my things, she was at full attention. Interesting enough, Thelma hovered around the new walking stick on the porch, despite me never having used it before. She already understood what its basic purpose was, or maybe she was just attuned to its special abilities. No sooner than we left the car, the stick seemed to guide me toward a lesser traveled fork in the trails. I realized the idea was preposterous. I mean, it was an inanimate object. I ignored the feeling of being led or directed while allowing the same unspoken whims to determine our meandering path. Sometimes I allowed Thalma to decide which way we would go. For possibly the first time ever, she let me lead the walk. The truth is, my new staff was drawing us towards something it wanted us to find. I didn't realize it at the time, but its pull is not unlike the magical draw of a water witch. 
We hadn't walked more than a quarter mile into the deeper forest when my feet unexpectedly veered off the marked trail as if they had a mind of their own. That is when I realized the bottom part of the staff was actually pulling me towards something. I'd lift it straight off the ground and then it would lean toward the area that it wanted us to go. It was as if an invisible rope was tied to the bottom and pulling independently of our natural instincts and walking choices. Even more telling than that, my dog immediately walked in the exact same direction that the stick was drawing us. They were in unison on this unknown mission. I was just a hapless bystander. Initially, I was in denial about those things. It was such a crazy idea that I was determined to fight against it. I'd try and redirect us, but it would gently pull us back on course. I thought I might have been losing my mind, or possibly dreaming. I mean, how could a gnarled piece of wood that I found dictate the path of our walks? More importantly, how did Thelma know what it had in mind? Once I resigned myself to allowing our hike to be coordinated by an enchanted walking stick, things were fine. I just let it lead us. Near the end of a high cliff, I spotted something shiny, partially buried in the fallen leaves. It was a key ring with a half a dozen keys on it. I picked it up and put it in my pocket for safekeeping. Someone had lost them, I thought, and might still be looking for them. I walked back to the marked trail and soon encountered a troubled looking couple walking toward us. Their eyes were fixated on the ground. I almost chuckled at the serendipity. They were no longer nature hiking. They were looking for something which they'd apparently lost. I was pretty sure that I knew what it was. Have you misplaced something? I asked. Both of them went to speak at once. She was obviously very exasperated and spoke over him. Our keys fell out of our pockets somewhere and we've been looking for them for at least two hours. I am beyond exhausted walking these trails trying to find a needle in a haystack. We can't even leave until we find them. Not wanting to torture them any longer, I shook them audibly in my pocket and smiled at them. Then I tossed them to the beleaguered gentleman. He obviously had been roasted for quite some time. Hopefully he'd be out of the doghouse soon. I found them off the trail, over there by the cliff edge. You must have lost them taking pictures over there. They both laughed at the realization they would have never thought to backtrack so far off the marked trail. I didn't dare explain that my magic stick mysteriously pulled us to the spot or they might have ran away fearing that I was some sort of lunatic. Frankly, I was just happy to do a good deed for the day. Even then, I wasn't completely sold on the far out idea that it took us to a remote spot to help out a frustrated couple. That would have required a little bit more than finding a set of lost keys. I was not prepared at all to consider that an inanimate piece of timber possessed paranormal capabilities. That surreal little moment of truth came much later. On the next hike, the wandering stick led Thelma and I to a remote rocky outcropping. It was more insistent this time. My dog pulled aggressively on her leash until she could reach a spot beside the rocks. I figured she knew a squirrel was hiding in there, but the random way she pawed various areas of the rock formation did not seem to be about catching a rogue rodent. There was actually a method to her madness. I could see that she was trying desperately to uncover something. I had never seen Thelma that focused on anything. It was fascinating to watch. I gave her leash a little more slack so she could achieve her mission, whatever that was. Meanwhile, my walking stick seemed to be pulling me toward the back side of the rocks. She has systematically dug up a rough grid of dirt until the underlining surface of the boulder. For the first time, 
what was beneath it was finally exposed. It took a moment for what I was seeing to register in my brain. The sheer size and skull was massive. That played heavily into why it required extra time for the amazing truth to make sense. The outcropping of dirt-covered rocks, which thousands had hiked past while totally unaware, was the exposed tip of a gigantic fossil site. Now, I'm no paleontologist, but the artifact was definitely the remains of a prehistoric dinosaur of the plant-eating variety. The organic skin and fleshy tissues were long gone. The bones jolting out of the soil were petrified replicas now, but it looked mostly intact. It was an incredible find, but since it was found in a state park, there was no question who owned it. I phoned the forest ranger's voicemail and left a message for him. I wasn't about to blurt out that my dog and bewitched walking stick uncovered a massive dinosaur fossil buried in the mountainside. That would have been the surest way to be labeled a crank caller. I simply stated that I needed for someone to call me back right away. When they finally did, I was understandably vague. I asked the ranger to meet me at the trail so I could show him in person. He didn't want to come without more details and I really couldn't blame him. I forwarded him some photos that I shot on my cell phone. That got his attention. When he did finally meet me, he brought a friend from the university. I led them both to the outcropping. When they saw what I had found, they couldn't believe their eyes. Seeing it partially exposed by an eager husky was far more impressive than gazing at a handful of cell phone images. The ranger's buddy had connections with a major museum and wanted to establish legal rights to excavate the site. That was out of my hands. All I did was show them the bones. They did the rest. At least I had Thelma's money paws to justify how I found it. Later on in the day, I was interviewed by the AP Wire News Service and officially credited for the find. That was pretty cool. Maybe I'll get a plaque on the wall when the dinosaur is put on display. The reporter went on and on about how it was a miracle that my dog had picked that exact spot to dig, but I just smiled and nodded. The secret of my wandering stick remained safe for the time being. If I had any doubts about its supernatural abilities, they were long gone now. With my handy mystery solving device, I was tempted to find more things, but I worked during the week. By the time I get home in the evening and eat, it's far too late to go off somewhere on an adventure. The big excursions would have to be limited to the weekends. Still, Thelma needed her exercise, so we went for a little trek around the neighborhood. I hoped it would be a peaceful walk, but the roving pack of neighborhood canine bullies did not allow that to happen. Near the middle of our quick circuit around the street, the dogs circled around with the intent to intimidate or worse. As they closed in on us, I was fully prepared to defend the both of us by any means necessary. It had been a basic reflex, but as soon as I raised the walking stick to threaten to bludgeon them, they began to whimper and shake. The feral dogs went from attack mode to terrified little puppies almost immediately. It wasn't from me, and it wasn't from my dog's defensive stance against them. It wasn't even from the threat of being hit by a large piece of wood. No. They were cowering in fear because of the wandering stick's ominous power. Somehow, they knew. It began to vibrate in my hands. The higher I raised it off the ground and pointed it toward the dogs, the more they backed away and squealed. Now, I wasn't quite sure if it was going to shoot laser beams or bolts of lightning at the snarling beasts, but they quickly recognized that they were in grave danger and fled. Hopefully, they'd remember that we were not the ones to be trifled with. It's funny, though. 
even after I understood, the enchanted staff held undeniable supernatural abilities. I didn't worry about my own safety in wielding it. Perhaps that was due to the events that I had experienced so far had all been very positive encounters. I was harnessing its power for good. I had no reason to think otherwise. When the opportunity arrived to discover what else the wandering stick wanted me to see, I loaded up the car and headed for the open road. This excursion felt different somehow. I was on edge the whole trip. Something about it made me anxious. Maybe it was the escalating nature of the previous hikes leading me to bigger and better discoveries. I assumed this time would reveal something even more significant, and those instincts were proven correct. I was drawn to a completely different set of mountain trails. Thelma was very restless. She sensed something that I couldn't begin to guess. There was a greater urgency from the wandering staff, exceeding the other instances by a very wide margin. The pull was intense. We were far off the beating path, and the terrain was difficult to traverse. I was being dragged by a frantic beast and a vibrating stick to find something which apparently really needed to be discovered. Despite all the clear signs of foreshadowing, I could not have guessed what it was. What I spotted was anticlimactic. It was a lady's brown leather purse, half covered in organic debris, with ornate shoulder straps made from woven leather. I was disappointed that it wasn't something bigger. Then I spotted a pair of matching shoes nearby. They were not the sort of sensible footwear or handbag that a knowledgeable person would choose for this harsh terrain. Then Thelma resisted getting any closer. I thought it was very odd considering her earlier zeal. She had been so enthusiastic digging up that dinosaur fossil. Now I was being held back by her for the very first time. The leash was drawn tightly as Thelma backed away from where I stood. She actively pulled me to the spot, then wanted far away for some reason. Meanwhile, our anatomy guide had deliberately drawn the both of us there to solve some sort of mystery. I was determined to find out what it was, with or without her help. It didn't take too long. I spotted the unmistakable form of a human skull, partially exposed through the soil. Other bones and decaying remains were visible once I realized the truth. I was standing in the middle of a crime scene. At least I couldn't say this was not a big deal. I backed away slowly to follow Thelma's lead, doing my best to not damage any of the evidence. Thelma was beyond eager to go back to the car. I finally understood why. We sat in the front seat while I decided how to handle things. I definitely had to report this. There was no question about that. But in doing so, would surely raise some difficult questions with the police detectives. They would ask me how I kept finding mysterious things in the woods. I didn't want to be the primary suspect of the victim's death investigation by default. I also didn't want to phone it in anonymously. They always traced those calls back to the caller, and it would look more suspicious to have not been upfront about my identity to start with. I mean, there was no reason at all why I couldn't find a dinosaur fossil and a human body, right? I hike a lot, so it wasn't outside the realm of possibility to discover two significant things in such a short period of time. Right? I didn't realize it, but the couple whose keys that I found by the cliff recognized me from the dinosaur story and contacted the reporter. They told him about my earlier good deed. The detective that interviewed me had really done his homework. He knew all about that too. How exactly did you happen to be there? It's not an easy place to find. I understand 
that you've been on a recent lucky streak of finding all sorts of strange things in different places. Are you buying lottery tickets? Sounds like you should. Tell me your story again from the beginning. I rolled my eyes at the skeptical detective routine. I had already told him the pertinent details three times and was consistent with each one. Maybe that was the issue. It sounded too rehearsed and very unnatural. Do you really think that I happen to have a nearly intact dinosaur skeleton just lying around to bury in a state park outcropping? Why would I do that? For publicity and accolades? He grinned at the unlikely scenario. It sounded more ridiculous when I outlined it in those colorful terms. The guy was simply observing how I'd react to pressure. I was not done expressing my righteous indignation. It was totally justified, but I laid it on too thick. Maybe I stole the couple's keys in the park, yeah, and then conveniently found them for the attaboy. No, no, I know you didn't plant the six-ton dinosaur, he said, then giggled at that preposterous statement. It took specialized equipment to excavate the fossilized remains. It's just that finding so many hidden things, as you have recently, is downright unusual. You aren't some kind of mystical psychic or clairvoyant, are you? I heard his partner chuckle in the observation room. With such overt sarcasm, I knew neither one of them believed it was anything more than a crazy series of coincidences. It was all a hilarious game to them, but that didn't stop me from playing along with them. Regardless, I was not about to suggest that a magic stick led me to the body. That would have carried it too far. I dialed it back a couple notches. Nope, my dog did. Both men howled at my deadpan delivery. Immediately, my interrogator's demeanor changed from the gist. They were just doing their jobs and trying to connect the dots of a highly strange situation. I realized how bizarre it was and might have been tempted to make a similar joke if I was in their shoes. Meanwhile, the truth was infinitely more insane. I wish I could have shared it with them. The detective stood up, shook my hand, and then thanked me for coming forward to help find justice for the deceased. Her identity is still a mystery, but they're hoping to run her DNA profile if a viable sample could be obtained. Then he promised to keep in touch. That's something that people often say out of habit, but I believed him this time. He seemed like a really good guy. I think the officer realized that I genuinely wanted to know what happened out of true concern, just as much as they did for official reasons. Since they had a potential crime to solve, I left them to their responsibilities. For once, I was not as anxious to get back to exploring. Every time I did, my wooden familiar led me to another source of controversy. If the next one was anything like the last, it would make it difficult for me to do anything about it. Maybe the enchanted staff sensed my apprehension. Thelma certainly could. She gently grabbed it in her teeth and dragged the stick over to me. She never brings me the leash like those cute little internet videos. This was an obvious effort to get the mystery squad back on track. She just wagged her tail and quote unquote talked until I relented and put on my boots. With the arc of discovery widening every time, I dreaded whatever this trip would uncover. We drove for a very long time and I purposely avoided the previous hiking trails. Thelma paced impatiently back and forth in the seat. She knew that I was stalling, but honestly, I wasn't inspired to go anywhere. There were no vibes from the walking stick this time. I was on my own to pick our destination and not being directed or led. I hoped that meant that there would be no unwanted excitement and nothing to find. I picked a beautiful park by the lake. 
It has a flat paved track around it for walkers, joggers, bicyclists, and rollerblade enthusiasts. It seemed like the perfect mundane place to avoid any more calls to the authorities. As it turns out, I could not have been any more wrong about that. The walking stick instantly nudged Thelma and I over to the side of the pavement. Staple to the side of the power pole was a worn out missing persons flyer. It showed the smiling face of a young lady who had been missing for about seven months. The first thing that caught my eye was the shoulder straps of her pocketbook. It was the exact same ornate design as the one I discovered in the mountainside. Under different circumstances, I might have thought it was a coincidence, but the walking stick began to vibrate with a restless energy which confirmed what I already knew. I couldn't even fathom why the missing lady would be up there in those dressy heeled shoes, but I could at least give the detective her name to expedite their investigation. Melissa Peterson, 29, was reported missing by her parents a couple towns over from where I live. The ragged flyer detailed which police department was handling the case and gave their direct number. I've never been more sure in my life of whose body I had found, but I didn't have a clue to how to assist the two departments, that is, without raising more eyebrows and suspicion upon myself. I still had the detective's card in my wallet. I decided that telling him was more important than the optic of always being in the right place to find secret things. I mean, what was a little more inconvenience to my pride or my reputation compared to their grief? I owed it to them to do the right thing. Now, to describe that call as awkward would have been an understatement. Hello, this is Detective Ron Defoe. Hello, Detective. Um, you interviewed me as a witness in the discovery of a body found up on Grassy Mountain? Ah, yes. You have the psychic dog, right? Has that gorgeous husky of yours solved the case for us? He said, laughing a good-natured laugh at the forced attempt at levity. But I just remained quiet until he was finished amusing himself. When I didn't join in the chuckles, he cleared his throat and switched gears on me. Did you have anything to add to your testimony, Mr. King? Uh, yeah, actually... Um, my clairvoyant husky wants you to look at the missing person case of Melissa Peterson of Gover County. She thinks that's the victim. The missing lady's woven handbag strap in the photo is very ornate and distinctive. It looks just like the ones that I found beside the human remains. That caught him totally off guard. It took him a few seconds to realize that I was playing along with his jest while simultaneously offering a serious piece of information. I then heard him typing. He repeated back the name to me as he entered it into the database. He didn't say anything, but I sensed that he was intrigued by what I showed him. The victim matched the general profile. She was about the right age, from the local area, and had been missing long enough to correspond with the body's decomposition of the unknown victim. We should have a complete DNA profile on our Jane Doe victim in a couple days, he assured me. I'll reach out to the department when we go and compare notes about their case. I must warn you, though, it's way too early to make any connections on something like this. A fancy pocketbook strap is not usually enough of a justification for busy detectives to investigate. At the risk of beating a dead horse, I continued the gag. My dog says it's her. He laughed an uncomfortable snort. The psychic dog thing had run its course. At the time, though, I wasn't even sure he'd look into it. But three days later, Detective Defio called me back. The identity of the victim was officially confirmed. Sadly, it was Miss Peterson. Her family had been notified in preliminary reports from the forensic pathologist ruled the death as unnatural. I knew what that was code for. 
Luckily, the authorities did not suspect any involvement from me. I knew that, or the detectives would not have been so transparent about the ongoing investigation. We both realized he did not believe Thelma was responsible for finding the crime scene. That was almost as preposterous as the bizarre reality was. What I didn't understand, though, was what DeFio really thought about my string of unusual discoveries. Did he really think that I was just unusually lucky? I decided to lay my cards on the table. Why are you being so understanding and openly communicative with me, detective? I'm not in law enforcement, and I know it looks highly suspicious for me to be so helpful all the time. I can tell there's something on your mind, which you aren't saying. Why don't you just level with me? He respected how straightforward I was and opened up about some odd circumstances, which caused him to trust me despite natural misgivings. His admission explained a great many things. Mr. King, I did some research about the victim. I was told that she practiced a form of ritual magic, whatever that is. Apparently, she was way up in the hierarchy of the local organization for Wiccans, or witches. I don't know. I don't know the proper terminology, but you get the gist, don't you? In no way am I judging her faith. We are a nation of many beliefs, but I strongly suspect her involvement in the occult was a factor in her death. I don't know for sure yet. The more I've learned about how that branch of spirituality is viewed here, the more I realize she probably had a dangerous meeting with the wrong person. If my hunch is correct, she paid the ultimate price for it. His revelation about her life and his working theory regarding her untimely demise was completely compelling to me, but not that surprising at all, especially considering my own recent brushes with paranormal experiences. Every bit of it screams supernatural. I can't believe that I'm about to utter these ridiculous words out loud, he admitted. I know you had nothing to do with her murder, and newsflash, I also realize that your dog is not clairvoyant either. We've had some fun with that, but we both know what's going on here, right? I am convinced of a number of impossible to accept things now, because I had a vivid premonition about her myself last night. It was so powerful and gripping that it helped me understand some greater truths. I'm not given to believing in psychic experiences, but I saw her murder unfold just as clearly as if a camera had been present. As if his paranormal testimony wasn't compelling enough, he had even more pertinent information to share. It was something I figured out already, but I was just too close to the details to see it. As I was about to learn, the detective was the other half of a hand-picked duo to avenge her death. I was the first. Four robed figures drug her to a remote spot in the hills, killed her, and then burned the body to hide the evidence. For reasons only she knew, after death, Miss Peterson's relentless spirit transferred itself to an enchanted walking stick, or totem in the woods. I saw it transpire in my vision. It's not a coincidence that it looks just like the twisted staff that you were holding at the crime scene when you reported the body, now is it? Her spirit is guiding you to find hidden things, isn't she, Benny? I simply nodded. It was such a relief to share the secret with someone. The relentless spirit of Melissa Peterson had reached out from beyond the grave to guide us, to avenge her murder. At least I wasn't alone any longer with that unsettling knowledge. The detective was in the same boat. He saw what happened, but couldn't share it with anyone because of the nature of how he knew. We had to find a legal way to connect the dots for the criminal process to bring her killers to justice. After the detective's supernatural confession session, we started going on hikes together. That way, Melissa could show us who was responsible for her death. I asked Ron 
to re-describe his vision of the event. I hoped that there was some overlooked detail that we could use to figure out who the conspirators were. Was it a rival cult, or maybe devout holy zealots determined to punish an unapologetic sinner? Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, immediately came to mind from the Old Testament. Would hyper-enthusiastic, Bible-thumping evangelists go that far? Why would they wear masks to hide their identities if they had no intention of allowing her to live? That scenario seemed far too extreme for modern times, but anything was possible. Was it a rival Wiccan set with an axe to grind over authority or territory? None of it made any sense, but then again, I couldn't imagine killing a person for having different beliefs than myself either. For the time being, we simply referred to the killers as them. I can't explain how, but the spirit of Melissa Peterson must have been in sync with my psychic canine. Thelma did not whine or pace impatiently each night when I got home for a walk. She must have been spiritually in tune with the more important need to combine excursions with fact-finding missions, specifically for the investigation. She knew what we were doing and why. We couldn't have been any more surprised when Melissa led us to the local Chamber of Commerce this time. We accepted that it must have been an essential destination in her quest for posthumous justice, but it was a radically different location to look for clues and there was nowhere to walk Thelma inside. Also, I didn't have the authority that Ron did to look through their official records. We just stared at each other a minute in total bewilderment. Finally, I suggested that he go inside and look around while the dog and I did a few laps around the city for exercise. That's when it got real awkward. The walking staff demanded that we go inside with Ron. Now, I probably don't need to explain how strange it would appear for an off-duty officer to walk into an office carrying a rustic wooden stick while asking to tour their facility and look through their legal paperwork. Our dismembered host desperately needed to show us something of paramount importance, but walking inside with a knotted piece of wood would severely weaken his credibility as a police detective. Or worse, he didn't even know what he was looking for. It's not like our spirit guide could talk. From a recent afternoon rainstorm, there was a standing puddle on the sidewalk, just outside the building. The staff drew us over to it. In the reflection, we saw a shimmering light, which did not seem to match the dull overcast gloom above us. Is that you, Melissa? I asked the blinding flash. My hand inadvertently placed the stick in the shallow puddle and tapped the concrete. The beam grew brighter until it was almost glowing. Ron and I grinned at the abject amusement. In her current ghostly form, Melissa could not speak, but she could respond in a way via the puddle. I still didn't know how to use that shimmering light to communicate with her but we were making visual contact with the source of our quest. Hopefully, the thing she wanted us to see would be glaringly obvious once he went inside. Mariam was the receptionist at the front desk, according to her plaque. She greeted Ron and asked if he had an appointment with Mr. LeFay, the president of the chamber. He showed her his badge and explained that he was a detective with the police department and needed to examine their records. She nervously called the office manager to meet with him in the lobby. Hello, I'm Abigail Williams, the general manager here. May I ask what your inquiry is regarding? Ron, recognizing a fishing expedition when he saw it, and deflected her nosy question with doubt expertise. Oh, it's just a routine matter at this point. But as with all official police investigations, we aren't at liberty to divulge the nature of them while they are active. They smiled politely at each other, but it was glaringly clear 
She was livid at being denied the answer. Part of the reason he was so vague was because if a suspect was guilty of something, they stress out and often crack. By not being fully aware of how much the authorities know, he allowed her to stew in her worries. It was a tried and true interrogation technique. Right this way, she said, as she led him to a row of gray filing cabinets holding their financial records. From the forthcoming way she volunteered them, Ron knew the evidence that he sought was not present. Again, Miss Williams tried to figure out why he was there. If you could just tell me a little bit about what you're trying to find, either I or Jonathan there can help you locate it. Yeah, thanks. I'll let you know if I need any help on anything. He pretended to scan through a few of their paper entries while Abigail watched indiscreetly from the corner of her office. She seemed to take note of which of the alphabetized drawers he opened. He looked at a few folders purely at random and then closed them, appearing deeply interested. As a distraction, to snoop covertly, he summoned her to make a copy of one of them. While she dutifully Xeroxed it in the other room, he checked out the pee drawer. There was no Peterson folder in it. Mr. LeFay never showed his face the whole time, despite almost certainly being alerted to what was going on. That spoke volumes. Anyone with no culpability would technically show their face as a sign of benevolence. He thanked them for their cooperation and said goodbye. Miss Williams returned to her office, presumably to brief her boss about what she knew about the unexpected investigation, while well, Ron shrewdly stopped at the receptionist's desk. Is this about the missing woman? Miriam asked. She had been paying attention too, and since he never even presented a reason for his visit, her question was particularly revealing. Ron glanced at Mrs. Williams' closed office door. She was far too busy filling in the president to realize that the receptionist was talking to him. That allowed him time to slip her his card. He discreetly asked her to call him after hours so they could talk candidly. He knew that she knew something. I walked about a dozen laps around the block waiting for him. I was exhausted and even Thelma had enough exercise for a change. But the potential connections he uncovered made all of it worthwhile. Right at 5.30, his cell phone rang. It was Mariam. He didn't want to give too much away or lead her down a predetermined path. So he wisely let her do most of the talking. What she divulged finally set the wheels of justice in motion. I had already searched for information on both Miss Williams and Mr. LeFay as my part in the teamwork. Neither were active in religious organizations that I could find. Their entire social media footprint seemed to be about capital enterprise, investments, and making money. Lots of money. That wasn't very surprising to me, though. They were the driving force for the Chamber of Commerce and local business merchants, but it did eliminate religious zealotry as a motive for Melissa's murder. Mariam told Ron that her bosses were obviously fixated on luring a large Christian organization to relocate to the community. Doing so would bring thousands of jobs and hundreds of millions in real estate revenue to the townspeople. The client families would need housing, restaurants, entertainment, and a family-oriented place to live all of which Mr. LeFay and his greedy investor friends promised to supply to them. They would become filthy rich overnight if they could just convince the reluctant organization to move their operations there. Mariam overheard this client tell Jonathan something which caused unwanted complications to the plan. They had researched their potential neighbors and were appalled to find a very open, unapologetic Wiccan set established in their conservative community. While everything else would have been a go, they could not 
in all good conscience, moved to a place where vile witchcraft was practiced so openly. The website for Melissa's coven derailed a multi-million dollar deal and LaFay and Williams were livid over it. They stood to lose a fortune in real estate contracts and kickbacks. First, they tried to get the coven to take their website down through intimidation. Then the outright political pressure didn't work, at which time Mr. LaFay hired private investigators to intimidate them, in person this time. The pieces were starting to fall into place. Mariam's testimony was critical in establishing the motive. Good old-fashioned textbook greed led to her death. Money was the oldest reason in the world to kill a person. They didn't give a damn about Melissa's coven, but their huge paychecks did. All while typing reports at her desk, Mariam overheard their anger and their frustration over the lack of progress. Melissa Peterson was mentioned by name by them many times. Even so, that was not proof of their culpability in itself. The authorities would need strong physical evidence to bring charges against the conspirators. The compelling hearsay of a nosy secretary would never stand up in a court by itself. Detective Defile began to worry about Mariam's safety, and their own for that matter. She had been present at the office during planning stages of the operation to silence Melissa. Mr. LaFay and Miss Williams might put two and two together about who the link to them was. As the president of the chamber, Jonathan would have powerful friends at City Hall. It wasn't very long before he was asked by his superiors about the nature of his visit to the Chamber of Commerce office. It helped to clue him in about which members of the law enforcement community around him were either compromised outright or at least sympathetic to the almighty dollar. He was careful to create a parallel report as a sanitized decoy explaining away his visit. The excuse that he made up seemed to satisfy them for the time being, but that forced Ron to conduct the investigation fully undercover. If the guilty parties found out that Melissa Peterson's case was on his docket, they'd realize he was somehow onto them. He asked his contact at her home jurisdiction department to minimize his involvement with the case. Even with all the safeguards in place, they were not stupid. He was assigned to the case when Benny King discovered the unidentified body. That was an undeniable connection which was hard to pass off as a coincidence. When he later asked to look at their files, if nothing else, the guilty were paranoid. He warned the secretary to avoid being alone with either of them after dark. When pressed for an explanation, Ron discreetly answered, you know why, that missing girl. Legally, he couldn't say any more to her, but realized her safety was at risk. If he tried to put her in a safe house, his superiors would know and it would be leaked back to them. That would have put an immediate end to his investigation. Things had to remain as normal as possible until a means was found to get them to incriminate themselves. We all wondered what our next step would be. In the past, Melissa was the mysterious driving force in our movements. Now, with Ron being in charge of solving her murder within the judicial system, it wasn't clear who was leading, and we had no means of communicating with her. Did she have a plan to expose her killers, or was it up to us to finish the case? Individually, or as a disjointed team, we continued on in search of a way forward. Apparently, Jonathan LaFay and Abigail Williams were not entirely satisfied with Ron's thin cover story. Since the body had been identified and the missing person case was filed in a different precinct, it wasn't his murder to solve. All the paperwork was turned over to their detectives. Then he was given numerous other cases to work. Well, that was normal procedure 
His new caseload was excessive and felt like busy work to keep him occupied and distracted. It was far away from Melissa's case. He quickly learned which of his superiors were probably on the LaFay Investments Group's payroll. Paranoia was completely understandable under all the circumstances. So, when I spotted a brown sedan which always seemed to be behind me, I called Ron about it. Through a bit of sneaky maneuvering, I managed to get the plate number. Ron had to ask a favor from a trusted buddy in another department, but he found out who the owner was. The car was registered to a private detective agency in town. That was not ironclad proof of anything, but it bore following up. Ron suggested I call Mariam at lunch when both suspects might be away to see if the Chamber of Commerce used that PI agency for official business. Turns out it was not necessary for her to look. Merriam said that the investigator that was always behind me in traffic was in their office about once a week in closed doors meetings with the two ring leaders. She didn't know why they hired him and didn't ask because he gave her the creeps, as she put it. I suppose they could have a legitimate reason for hiring a PI to do some investigative work, but I couldn't think of any. So many of these type of investigators were notorious for harassing people for loan payments or spying on philandering spouses, instead of being trained investigators who happened to work outside of law enforcement to help police, they often had the reputation of being muscle for higher thugs with a badge. Could this creep be one of the unknown conspirators? We did not have proof yet, but the odds were moving in that direction. Ron did some more digging on him, but had to be secretive with it. His actions in the department were being watched. No doubt informing LaFay and Williams of their actions and movements. I was trying not to be paranoid, but in this case, it was definitely justified. Ron delivered a much needed reality check. It brought the danger all the way home for me. These people killed someone because she stood in the way of their money. Just because I haven't made public accusations against them yet does not mean we are not all targets for the same fate as Melissa Peterson. They couldn't possibly know how we know, but they are suspicious and vigilant. They are definitely aware her remains were discovered and that you identified her. Your name is all over the papers and the TV, Benny. If they have spies at the other department where she was reported missing, they also know that I contacted their officers with your phone and tip. You are on their radar. Everything about it seemed surreal. It seemed like a far-fetched plot to kill someone just because they made someone else feel uncomfortable. I couldn't reconcile going to those extremes, but Ron was absolutely right. It was for millions and millions of dollars. Unscrupulous people would kill for a fraction of that. Uh, then it's probable that they're watching each of us for signs of a case being built against them? I inserted. Do I need to get official police protection? Ron then looked at me in disbelief. <laughs> Are you kidding? You definitely need police protection. Mariam needs protection. Even I need official backup. But under what authority or justification would they assist us? Since we had spooky dreams and visions about a murder that we can't prove, or that a vibrating stick led us to the culprits, we would receive the safety of a padded room at Arkham Asylum if we uttered any of that metaphysical ghost stuff out loud. Officially, we don't have bupkis, nada, zip. We are on our own here. He saw how worried and defeated I looked from the unpalatable pill of truth. The conspirators could decide that we were a loose end that they needed to tie up permanently. If they did, we might not even see it coming. 
I felt like we were sitting ducks, or in Thelma's case, a sitting dog. I wanted the killers to be arrested and prosecuted for what they did, but I didn't want to always be looking over my shoulder for the rest of my life while we tried to bring them to full legal accountability. The only way we can get justice for Miss Peterson in this physical world is to pretend none of the other things happened. Supernatural premonitions may be vivid and convincing, but they do not hold up in courts of the living with jurors who haven't experienced them, especially if we can't even get a DA to bring charges against them. We need tangible evidence, not voodoo. I'm certain Melissa was present for our spirited little exchange. That night, Thelma barked and tugged aggressively at the covers on my bed. I sat up in hyper-awareness. Huskies rarely bark, but when they do, it's cause for alarm. I did not expect a shadowy assassin to come lurking in the middle of the night, but that's exactly what happened. The sound of the window breaking in my back door was faint, but I was wide awake and listening for it. Thelma's ears perked up to full attention. She then faced the entrance to the bedroom in attack mode for our uninvited guest. Freeze! rang out in an authoritative manner from the living room. In the light of rising danger, Ron decided to be my very own unofficial protection detail. After a brief struggle in the dark, the man was handcuffed and taken into custody. Unsurprisingly, he had no identification on him, but I was positive that he was the fourth conspirator in Melissa's death. At headquarters, the man refused to divulge his name or his employer, but his vehicle was registered to a dummy corporation doing business as an LLC. It was the perfect setup to operate their criminal activities, with a built-in deniability to the private investigator or the client. After doing some digging, it was traced back to the creep that was following me. Despite that telling outcome, all the arrested thug could be brought up on charges for was breaking into my house. Officially, it looked like a simple robbery attempt. We could not prove anything else and didn't even try. From that point on, there was no more ambiguity, theorizing or wondering. They knew we were witnesses and had already proven that they came to our homes to neutralize the threat to their freedom. Mariam was in grave danger as well. If they hadn't already, they would soon figure out that she was the office connection between us. We had to bring her into our confidence and protection. That meant divulging all of it to her. I wasn't looking forward to explaining the supernatural elements of it, but she had to know everything to be prepared for what was to come. Fortunately, the relentless spirit of Melissa had prepped her at some point. We didn't get into details, but Mariam got her own supernatural vision to confirm exactly what her employer did and how we knew about it. The charade was unraveling slowly. One of their henchmen was arrested and was in custody. The rest were surely worried that he might spill the beans and incriminate them. Mariam requested official vacation time before they made her disappear. She took our advice and relocated for the time being to my guest bedroom. At least we were all together and could shelter in peace. That evening, Ron received an unexpected call on his work phone. The look on his face during the long conversation told me that it was related to our mutual secret. When he hung up the phone, he turned to Mariam and I. That was the Gilmore County detective in charge of Melissa's case. His name is Michael Sherman. He says that he has some things that he needs to discuss with me in person. He didn't want to say anything specific over the phone, but I'm hesitant to drive over there. I don't know this guy at all. I don't know a thing about him. Maybe he's in their back pocket or it's all a ruse to lure me into some dark alley 
or to separate me from you two. He seems sincere enough, but I have no way of knowing the truth. In the end, there's no choice. I have to meet him. For that reason, I'm giving you this. Do not hesitate to use it if the need arises. It was a Beretta 9mm handgun. I shook my head and tried to hand it back to him. I'd never handled firearms before and really didn't want the responsibility. Ron insisted though and Miriam was visually relieved when I finally accepted it. She clearly wanted some firepower backing us up while Ron was away. Just point and click, that's all you have to do. The safety is off, I repeat, the safety is off. Pick it up, point it, then put your finger on the trigger. That is the only other important part here. Oh, and make sure that you identify your target before you fire. I don't want my good shirt ruined with a bullet hole and copious amounts of blood. His wit might have got some laughs if we weren't in such desperate straits. We both told him to be careful and meet Detective Sherman in a public place. He rolled his eyes at my rookie advice. I suppose it came across like I was speaking to a gullible child. I assured him that I didn't mean to sound patronizing and Ron nodded in agreement. He thanked me for my concern, then spoke directly to Thelma. I need you to look after these two while I'm gone. Will you protect them for me, girl? Thelma then wagged her tail enthusiastically and responded with a husky whine. The irony of it all was that we were not their main focus at the moment. Only an officer of the law, like Ronald DeFeo, could possibly find a way around the roadblocks and political walls that the murderers had erected, with the help of their powerful friends in the department, of course. Now, Ron might be able to orchestrate a walk-around to prosecute them by connecting agencies outside of their control. He was by far the biggest threat to the murder for Devadin gang. Unbeknownst to us, the private investigator himself was waiting for him to leave. He followed Ron in the brown sedan and intended to pull alongside and run him off the road or fire a few shots through the driver's window. Unfortunately, he never got the chance to. Ron was wise to the dangers we were facing and took Melissa with him as his protection. The moment the window rolled down for the attack, Ron threw the bewitched walking stick like an Olympic javelin. The impressive toss impaled the would-be assassin's throat like a shish kebab. The vehicle immediately ran off the road and struck an old oak tree. A trio of limbs shattered the windshield. By a traffic investigator's reasonable assumption, it would appear to be a tragic freak accident. Ron confirmed that the P.I. was dead and carefully retrieved the instrument of fury from the body itself. With his help, Melissa had attained partial vengeance, one down and three to go. He quickly left the scene before anyone witnessed him there. At the rendezvous point, the two nervous detectives met. Ron was shaken up by the sombering brush with death. He was worried that the arranged meeting was a ruse to get him into the open. He had his backup weapon ready, just in case. The two lawmen walked into the gazebo in the downtown park to talk, in private. With all the joggers and bicyclists circling the track, it was still public enough that Ron felt relatively safe. Melissa had been busy in Detective Sherman's mind as well. She had shared her fiery death details with him the same way she did with the others. But knowing the truth about what happened to her was not even close enough to bring charges against anyone. Michael was deeply troubled by the death of the complex conspiracy and wanted justice for the victim, but just like the others, did not know how to achieve it. The truth was he wanted to contact those individuals his nocturnal dream weaver 
assured him were safe to confide in. So, let me get this straight. The wandering soul of my murder case took matters into her own hands and contacted you and a couple other people, all to avenge her death. She used dreams and psychic visions, like the ones I experienced, to show us what happened. Is that right? Pshh, this is so crazy. I never believed in Hocus Pocus stuff, but I can't deny what you're telling me. Now she's figured the president of the Chamber of Commerce, his official manager, and a private investigator as the ones who killed her in the woods. Who was the fourth suspect? I definitely saw four hooded people in my vision. Ron was hesitant to tell him that the P.I. was taken care of. He just met the guy after all. And throwing an improvised spear through another person's neck and covering up the crime, even in self-defense, was a legal line that he never crossed before. Trust would have to come with time. For now, he answered the question without any context. The fourth conspirator worked for the private eye. I got the jump on him a few nights ago when he tried to break in, then dispatched Benny King. He's in county lockup at the moment for a B&E. I'm not sure how long they will keep him behind bars, but he's not in the picture right now. My main concern is LaFay and Williams. They were the investigators in this whole thing. They have very powerful friends at the police department and all around town. They might even have allies at your precinct. Be very careful who you share any information with. Michael then nodded shrewdly. He'd been in law enforcement long enough to realize insidious layers of corruption can permeate any level of society. He and Ron used their own personal phones to communicate from that point on, in case they were being monitored by headquarters. Meanwhile, Ron shared details of their newest ally with Mariam and I, as well as welcome news of the late private investigator's thorny demise. Being as he had been the muscle in the ongoing offensive against us, it made Mariam and I breathe a sigh of relief. Neither one of us were convinced that Jonathan or Abigail would have the nerve to come after us themselves, and the PI's assistant was still in jail for the attempted robbery charges. It would have been very easy to lower our guard and think it was all over. Again, Ron was the voice of wisdom and practicality. These two are in the same nuclear-sized crisis that we were in beforehand. Nothing has improved for them. If anything, it's even gotten worse. There will be new charges added to their efforts to have us killed. Make no mistake about it. They have not given up and will not feel safe until we are dead. We have to keep this going. With their enforcer dead and his minion in jail, they will try and handle it themselves because hiring another set of thugs would mean more loose ends. They do not want that. So they're going to finally get their hands dirty trying to come after us themselves. Both of them are unscrupulous and highly clever, Marion added. They'll try something unusual to catch us unaware. I can tell they realized that I was fully aware of what they had done to Melissa when I requested a vacation. They were just playing along with the facade, hoping we'd all be together in one spot at some point. I'm certain they authorized my time off to eliminate us in a single location. That's how that greedy little prick Jonathan operates. He's, he's methodical, patient, and highly cunning. Then we better get ready for them. With my arresting the investigator's assistant, they would suspect a trap if they came back here for us again. We need to congratulate somewhere else, so they feel comfortable coming at us. You see, Ron, ordinary, that would make perfect sense, Miriam argued. However, it's so logical that LaFay and Williams won't come back here to the scene of an earlier crime that they absolutely would. Just because they think we are safe against it happening again. He's a huge chess player and a gambler. I wouldn't put it past them both to do the most unlikely thing imaginable. Because it would be so unexpected. 
We kept Melissa's gnawed totem in the living room corner as an early warning system against their attacks. It began to vibrate violently around 11 p.m. The full length of the staff started to glow in ethanol color which did not match the natural light spectrum. Slowly, the same glow spread around the room until we were bathed in the blinding light. We had no idea what was about to happen, but the spirit of Melissa saw it all. Lafay and Williams were outside the house pouring gasoline around the sides and foundation. They meticulously doused every single window in every single doorway so escape would be almost impossible. As with their first victim, they intended to burn us alive in a massive pyre, but they failed to take an important thing into consideration. Her unjust death only made her more powerful. Melissa spread a protective aura around the entire house, which prevented the fuel from igniting. In a glowing sense of frustration and of bewilderment, the two of them tried to start the blaze, but could not. Match after match blew out from a phantom wind hovering around them. Even a hastily retrieved cigarette lighter failed to ignite my saturated home. Growing increasingly desensitized of being around all those flammable materials, they grew too careless. Unfortunately for them, their own gas-soaked clothes were not immune to incineration. Simultaneously, they caught fire and burned to a crisp, just as they intended for us to do. We watched in complete shock from the windows. Ron had called Detective Sherman to come to our aid, and by the time he arrived, the ringleader and his greedy understudy were just a pile of ash and smoldering cinder in the backyard. An official investigation was opened immediately, and shortly after, we were cleared of their deaths. Video surveillance showed LeFay purchasing the fuel while Williams remained in the car. Her cell phone showed a map search of my home address. There was no question they came to my house to murder us as we slept. The authorities took significantly longer, however, to put together a justified motive for the earlier crime or tying everything together. We knew the truth but were not able to reveal the supernatural elements. In the end, it was not necessary at all. All the pieces came together from good old-fashioned police work and modern technology combined. They discovered LaFay's efforts to lure the religious organization to relocate to the town via emails and texts, and read their damning correspondence. The detectives found concrete evidence of the two of them hiring the private eye to stalk and intimidate Miss Peterson into shutting down the coven. They used geo-trackers to place the four conspirators at her murder site during the time of her disappearance. Tens of millions of dollars were more than enough of a reason for why they killed Melissa. That part was settled. From there, it got trickier. Ron went from the investigator who identified her body to a victim himself at attempted murder by the same killers. It looked highly suspicious. As a matter of police policy, he was then put on administrative leave pending the conclusion of an investigation. As we had hoped, they chalked up the PI's death to a traffic accident, but it was clear that Williams and DeFay had targeted Ron, Mariam, and myself for some reason. The detectives on the case needed to know why. It was clear we knew something. They interviewed us separately and compared notes, but we had already practiced our individual stories beforehand. What we told them was essentially the truth, with some rather large glaring omissions. I found her remains while hiking and later discovered her missing poster by random chance. It was a stretch to accept those things happened to only one person, but crazier things have happened. They let it go. Ron just happened to be the investigator on duty who I reported the find to. He had no prior connection to me, nor to Melissa Peterson or Mariam. That was verified. 
she was in her office, and as a busybody that she is, happened to overhear things which incriminated them. The detectives accepted those things as believable as well. They had a really hard time accepting that we just happened to start hanging out together. Afterward, by pure happenstance, we didn't try and push it. It would have been a bridge too far. Ron felt it would be best for us to admit that we realized they had very powerful friends and it was impossible to prove that we knew at the time without help. The detectives got their aha uh -huh moment when we admitted we were there in my house because we feared the wrath of the Chamber of Commerce conspirators. That was all they needed to close the case and remove us from the suspicious list. Interestingly enough, the PI's assistant was found dead in his cell at county jail the next morning. Luckily for us, they have cameras on the inmates for that exact purpose. A review of his suicide video showed him back away in terror from something unseen in the corner of his cell. He put his hands up as if defending himself from an invisible adversary. Then he began to bow in moral contrition and cry hysterically. Afterwards, the man made a noose from his bedsheet and hung himself. I have no doubt what he saw. The vengeance of Melissa was finally complete. Ron realized his position there was compromised by the elements who helped LaFay and William spy on him. So he left that department and joined the police force where Michael works. Now they are partners. Mariam retailed her job at the Chamber of Commerce and was eventually promoted to be office manager. By all accounts, she is very happy with her new president. Though ambitious and enterprising, he is not going to hire a private detective to harass people or even worse. And as for me, I still go on long walks and hikes whenever I can. Thelma and I need the exercise. And Melissa still has many things to show us.